Shalom, and welcome to this special webcast. And thank you for joining us on Zoom, on Facebook Live for today's program. I'm Michael Miller, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the Jewish Community Relations Council of New York, JCRCNY. And I first want to acknowledge and thank our gracious and generous sponsor, the Free Synagogue of Flushing. We're truly appreciative of their incredible leadership, President Ed Schauder, who is also a member of the JCRC Board of Directors, Cantor and Executive Director Alan Brava, and the rest of the team at the synagogue for the awesome work they do in the community and for sponsoring conversations like the one we're going to have today. And it's now my distinct pleasure to introduce Ari Ackerman, who will serve as moderator for the discussion with baseball greats Art Shamsky and Ron Bloomberg. Ari Ackerman is a successful serial entrepreneur, strategic investor, and proud philanthropist. Ari's role in his business ventures includes strategic development, growth, and overall management. His entrepreneurial history includes being the founder and chief executive officer of BunkOne.com, the enormously popular technology company that allows parents to see online pictures and send emails or bunk notes to kids at summer camps, as will be the case again this summer. In March of 2017, he had a successful sale and exit of Bunk One to private equity firm Aquiline Capital Partners. Ari grew up in New York City and received his undergraduate degree from Duke University and an MBA with honors from Northwestern University, the Kellogg School. His philanthropic endeavors include serving on multiple boards, such as our board, the JCRC NY, APAC, Hillel, UJA, and he was recently elected as the National Young Leadership Cabinet Co-Chair for the Jewish Federations of North America, JFNA. One of his recent entrepreneurial ventures is Tribe, a unique dating app that facilitates meaningful connections for Jewish singles. Importantly for baseball and sports fans, he's also a partner and advisory board member in the Derek Jeter-led group that purchased the Miami Marlins in October of 2017. Also, it's important to note that Ari will be honored with the Continuity Legacy Award at the upcoming JCRCNY Virtual Gala on Wednesday, June 23rd at 7 p.m. For, there it is, nice picture. For further information about the gala, please visit jcrcnygala.org or send a message to any of the co-hosts of this session. And now, it's my great pleasure to shift the focus over to Ari, to pitch the ball over to Ari, who will introduce Art and Ron and lead the conversation. Ari, it's all yours. Batter up. Thank you, Michael. I love all the baseball references. Very proud of you. And uh, Michael, he didn't mention this himself, but he will be honored uh, at the event in a few weeks. And that is well overdue and very much well-deserved. Michael, thank you for the introduction and, and thank you for being such a good friend for many years. And thank you, obviously, to the JCRC for hosting this event. Uh, and of course, to the uh, hundreds of people who have joined uh, today, including many uh, family and friends. Um, so now I will introduce or give a quick uh, bio on our two special, special guests today. First, Art Shamsky. Art uh, was a professional baseball player for 13 years with the Cincinnati Reds and New York Mets, including being a part of the Miracle Mets, of course, that won the 1969 World Series. In the summer of 2007, Art managed the Modine Miracle, one of the six teams that played in the Israeli Baseball League. And in 2012, he was also named the ambassador for the Israel Association of Baseball. So I was just finishing up Art's introduction, I believe, when I got cut off. So Art wrote two books, The Magnificent Season, about the Jets, Mets, and Knicks, who all won championships for the first time in their history in 1969 and 1970. And After the Miracle, which was released two years ago to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the incredible championship. And now my good friend, my new friend, Ron Bloomberg. Ron was a professional baseball player for eight seasons with the New York Yankees and Chicago White Sox. He was a career 293 hitter with 140 walks and 133 strikeouts. Stats you definitely don't see uh, today from uh, anyone. In the summer of 2007, Ron was Art's rival in the Israeli Baseball League and managed the Beit Shemesh Blue Sox. And we'll hear more about their rivalry later. 
Uh, in April 2006, Ron's biography titled Distinguished Hebrew, the Ron Bloomberg story was released by Sports Publishing. The book discusses Blom Bloomberg's life leading up to his major league career, his playing days as a Yankee, and his Jewish heritage. In 2021, he published his second book, The Captain and Me, on and off the field with Thurman Munson, in which he advocates for Munson's introduction into the Hall of Fame. So welcome, guys. Welcome. And thank you uh, to both of you for joining us today. It's great to be able to talk to you. We heard so much about you and uh, this is going to be fun and, and all these uh, people out there and uh, it's a beautiful day wherever you are and we're ready to begin. We absolutely are and it absolutely will be fun. And Ron, it's a pleasure to meet you. And I must say that Art and I uh, have been friends for many years. We actually met um, back in 2007 when we uh, rode the same float in the Israeli Day Parade and been, have been friends ever since. So, all right, it's great to see you as well. Uh, it's great to see you, Ari. Um, you know, it's, it's almost good that you got cut off with my introduction because half of the stuff is lies anyway. So, uh, and you went right to the big guy over here, Ronnie Bloomberg. So, uh, um, it's great to see you. Uh, I'm so happy for your success in business and with the Marlins. And uh, and who knows, uh, maybe one day you'll be uh, the uh, main owner of a team and uh, I expect that to happen relatively soon. Well, well, I appreciate that. But uh, today we're talking about you guys, but I appreciate that very, you're very, always very kind, Art, and you're such a mensch always. Um, so let's start uh, with the early years growing up. Uh, Ron, I know you grew up in Atlanta in the South and I love the accent, obviously. And Art, you grew up in St. Louis and I know you went to uh, University City High School. And I know where you went to high school, uh, I heard from a, a very reliable source uh, is a big deal. So University City High School. Uh, and so can you talk about your early family life uh, and what it was like growing up both Jewish in the South and in the Midwest? And uh, Ron, I'll start with you. Well, you know, uh, I was very, very lucky in my life. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and, and uh, I got to do something actually what I wanted to do. And uh, living down South, uh, people don't realize uh, baseball was not the biggest sport. Uh, the biggest sport was actually uh, football and basketball. You know, you're talking about the uh, Georgia Bulldogs. You're talking about Road Tide Road, Alabama, and Tennessee, and North Carolina. And I would say Duke, but unfortunately, I would say Duke in basketball. But uh, uh, living down south, people didn't realize half of my teammates when I was actually growing up uh, I, I came from the South where, you know, uh, uh, Lester Maddox was actually the uh, governor down in uh, uh, Georgia. Uh, there was George Wallace, who was actually the governor in Alabama. And then you get to South Carolina, it says, welcome to Klan's country. And, and people don't realize half of my teammates, when I played sports, I played baseball, basketball, and football, uh, that actually uh, uh, half my teammates uh, were in the KKKs. And uh, that's what I actually grew up. And uh, so, you know, when people were talking about a, a minority, basically living a Jew down South, I was a major minority, but I was very, very lucky. I got drafted by the Yankees in 1967. When I was the number one draft choice in the country. And the greatest thing in the whole world, Harry, it was to be able to sign with the New York Yankees and to put their Yankee pinstripes on and to be able to play in Yankee Stadium and to play in the very, the, the hollow, the, the greatest grounds in the whole world, Yankee Stadium. And, uh, and to play in the, and also I forgot to mention the greatest fans in the world. <laughs> I love it. A plug for the fans in the stadium and the team. Well done, Ron. All right, what was it like growing up in St. Louis? Well, I, I grew up in a... Um in a wonderful area in St. Louis, western part of St. Louis, uh, University City, as you mentioned. And, and um, you know, my family uh, was uh, not the most religious family in the world, but, uh, but uh, it was a wonderful experience for me to have parents like I had. And uh, my dad was the first person that uh, started soft tossing baseballs with me when I could walk. I just started to walk. And, and um, uh, everybody was supportive of me growing up. And, uh, you know, I, 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 you, know I went, you mentioned my high school, University City, which... Also, uh, Kenny Holtzman, who was a great pitcher in the big leagues, uh, left-handed pitcher, and, and uh, Bernard Gilkey, who ended up playing in the big leagues uh, with a couple of teams, uh, came from that high school. So for me, growing up in the area was terrific. And uh, the thing I remember about the, the most was that I had all these friends that all they wanted to do was play baseball. So that really was, for me, the, 
the, the catalyst that kind of got me going in sports. And, and the reality of it was, um, if it wasn't for my friends, I probably would have never gone on to play baseball in the, the career I had because they were so supportive of me. And I'm sure some of them wish they would have made it to the big leagues and some were pretty good athletes, but I was very lucky. And, uh, and I, I always look at the time growing up in St. Louis, St. Louis Cardinal fan growing up and, and um, many people say, well, why didn't you sign with the Cardinals? Back then you could sign with any team. But um, it was just one of those things that um, the Cincinnati Reds, when they signed me, um, they really treated me well. I worked out for them at the, the old Bush Stadium, the old ballpark in St. Louis. And I remember being on the field with all these great players. And I was 17 years old working out with them. And they treated me great. So I ended up signing with the Reds and went on to play in the minor leagues and in the big leagues with them And before I got traded to the Mets. But Growing up in St. Louis was very special. I still have a sister who lives back there, and and uh, I often get back to visit them, uh, my my family back there. But uh, the reality of it is, I'm a New Yorker now, having played uh, for a team that won the World Series. But uh, St. Louis will always be very very special to me. I love it. I love it. There's a lot of people from St. Louis on this call who who appreciate that sentiment as well. Um, so you guys are talking baseball a bit. So let's start with baseball and. Uh, I know reading your bios, you are both great multi-sport athletes, not just baseball. Or you, you uh, played a lot of basketball, as I read, and Ron, uh, basketball, football, and track. You got 100 football scholarships and 125 basketball scholarships, as I read. Um, but you guys chose baseball. Um, and Ron, you mentioned you were the number one pick in the 67 draft by the Yankees. Um, so can you talk about that, about your road to the majors uh, after you were the number one pick? I imagine it was a lot of pressure uh, being the first pick in the draft. Well, in 1967, I signed a letter of intent to play basketball at UCLA with John Wooten. And also, I signed a football scholarship uh, to play at the University of Alabama with uh, Bear Bryant. But at that particular time, when you sign what they call a letter of intent, and a letter of intent is once you sign that contract, basically it's a bonding contract. And if you decided to play basketball, I would have to go to UCLA. If I played football, I have to go to Alabama. But I knew that, you know, I was going to get drafted by the Yankees, uh, uh, you know, being a Jew, living down south. And at that time, Atlanta, well, well, the Yankees were owned by CBS then. And everybody always looked at the Yankees as very anti-Semitic. And I did not know that till actually I came up to New York because I thought, you know, all, there's just Jews up in New York. <laughs> you know, that, that's, you know, I mean, that's what I always thought. You know, I, and my parents... They always said, you know, uh, if you always have the opportunity to play baseball, you know, if you always if you have a chance, go up to New York and play baseball. And I very I was very, very lucky. Got drafted by the Yankees and it was a no brainer. I signed with the Yankees in uh, 67. I was 17 years old uh, when I first uh, signed with the Yankees. Uh, my mom and dad, uh, we all flew up on a Piedmont Airlines to go up to uh uh, uh, New York and my parents had no money. So, and, uh, and, you know, they flew us up to uh, New York and I knew I was in the right place because as soon as we landed and the cab driver was a, uh, uh, he was a Goldstein and I knew right off the bat, I saw on the little, uh, uh where they had the uh, medallion, his name was a uh, something Goldstein. And I knew I was in the right place. And then I was very, very lucky. And then I went to, uh, uh, they put us up at the Hilton, uh, my mom and dad, and it was a big sign. They said, welcome, uh, first Jewish Yankee, Ron Bloomberg. And then I signed, and then they actually took me, uh, uh, the, well, the team took me to the stadium. I signed the contract, uh, went up uh, and uh, went up to the press box and saw uh, uh, Rizzuto, uh, Bill White, and Frank Messer. And... Uh, and it's really, really funny. Who was also in the uh, uh, the press box was Walter uh, uh, Cronkite, and I had no idea who he was. Being from the South, if it wasn't the Temptations and the Four Tops, I had no idea who they were. To be honest with you, but uh, but I was my first interview was up in New York was Walter Cronkite, and uh, to look in, and to go to Yankee Stadium and to and to see the monuments and uh, and uh, it was just. You know, that was my fantasy. I lived a fantasy. I lived something what I wanted to do my whole life, and I got to play there. So thank God. And I, like I said before, I did something what I wanted to do, and the guy up above gave me the opportunity. 
Amazing. Well, you worked hard at it as well. And just a, a slight tidbit, my, my father was on this call. Our family was in the taxi cab business. So there are a lot of Jewish taxi cab uh, business owners at that point. So that's a, it's a hilarious that that's the first impression you had of New York City. Um, and so, Art, you had mentioned that you uh, signed as after your freshman year um, by the Reds. Uh, and I read that you roomed with Pete Rose. Uh, there's got to be some good stories there. Or there was a when it, when you roomed with him, it looks like uh, you're you're shaking your head a little bit. But uh, there must be some good some P, good Pete Rose stories you have from your time with them a little bit. And uh, well, we were together in uh, believe it or not, way back in 1960, up in uh, Geneva, New York, which is a little small town upstate New York, right on uh, Lake Seneca, and we uh, played in the New York Penn League back then. Uh, for those who can remember that far back, uh, there was uh, only 16 teams in, in, in baseball at the time. So you uh, you really had to work your way up in the minor leagues to get to from one level to the next. And we started in Class D together. And um, we weren't even prospects back then. Uh, also, Tony Perez, who's now in the Hall of Fame, was on that team. And uh, I think the three of us together were more suspect than prospects. And so all we were trying to do was get to the next level, next level which was Class D, C, B, A, double A, and triple A. It's much different right now. With obviously, with more teams, it's much easier to get to the big leagues than it was back then. But um, we we were we were all just young kids trying to get to the next level. And and um, while I do have some stories, I don't want to bore you with all those stories that we had when we were 18 years old playing in the New York Penn League, getting uh, I think it was a dollar and a half a day meal money, and making I think $400 a month in Class D baseball. But when you're just turned 18 years old and all you want to do is play baseball. There's nothing better in life. And so we thought that was a lot of money. And, and then we went on um, a couple more years in the minor leagues. Pete went to the big leagues in 1963. I spent five years in the minor leagues because at that time, even when they had expansion in 1962, there was still, still only 20 teams in the major league. So it was much more difficult to get to the big leagues back then. And what happened was, uh, you know, you paid your dues and, and, but the experiences we had, in the minor leagues, so you you just they're just unbelievable and and too many stories to tell right now. But certainly um, had wonderful times and, and, and the game of baseball for us was just uh, uh, just we loved it. All we wanted to do was again get to the next level. And luckily, uh, all of us ended up being getting into the big leagues. And Pete went on to have that incredible career. And and um, you know you can argue all day about whether he should or shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. But I was lucky enough to come up with the Reds and play with incredible baseball players uh, who ended up um, either playing for the Reds or other teams because, again, there wasn't so much room in the big leagues for guys to make, make it to the big leagues. But um, I was part of the, the prelude to the big red machine, which, of course, was the great teams in the 70s with the Reds. But, but uh, when I got traded in the Mets, and, and which at the time seemed like uh, wasn't the best the thing for my career, it turned out to be the best because coming to the Mets and then winning a World Series two years later, was incredible, and I'm still in New York because of it. I love it. Well, I, I saw one quote that, uh, you know, you had those baseball dreams, but, but you said your mother certainly wanted me to go to college and become a doctor, of course. What else is a Jewish boy supposed to do? So maybe she had a little different thought for you initially, but I'm sure she, you know, was very proud when you did end up being the incredible well, ball player that you became. Well, she knew that I wasn't going to be a doctor when she saw my first grades in high school, so that wasn't <laughs> going to happen. And, uh, you know, it's funny because all I wanted to do was play baseball. And I'm sure Ronnie feels the same way. Uh, um, um, I, I hated being inside when it was nice outside. And again, I, I go back to the, the friends that I grew up with. All they wanted to do was play baseball. And we'd make up games in, in, in schoolyards. And we'd go to, uh, as we got older, we'd go to, to parking lots where they had lights when it got dark and we'd make up games. It was a much safer world back then. Right. But um, if it wasn't for my friends, who knows what would have happened. But uh, uh, I, I realized at a very young age, I was not going to be a doctor or, or anything more than, a, than hopefully be a baseball player. Well, it turned out well for you, I must say. And just continuing, you talked about the 69 season. So, yeah, and you also, I mean, another accolade you had was four homers in consecutive at-bats. So, but in terms of the 69 season, uh, you had 538 in the NLCS. So just tell us a little bit about what it was like to be part of that dreams, dream team. Well, again, I'm still in New York because of it. 52 years now, 52 years later, people still talk about that team. I, I think, you know, when I talk to people about it and uh, lucky enough to write about it in, in 2019, um, the anniversary was very, very special. And we've lost uh, 10 or 11 guys from that team, which is 
uh, with, but, but there's still a nucleus of guys around. And, and what, what made that team so special is that uh, nobody expected us to win. You know, it's, it's one thing if you finish a season and you're in first or second place and you don't win the World Series, but you know you're going to come back next year, you're going to have a good team. Uh, that's something different. The we were ninth, a half game out of last place in 1968. And nobody thought we were going to do anything. And based on our record, uh, I'm, I'm, I agree with them. But we did have signs with young pitching. We had, of course, Tom Seaver, Jerry Kuzman, Tug McGraw, and Nolan Ryan. And then a lot of good young pitchers and good defense and timely hitting. But uh, nobody thought we were going to win. And it, for all of us to, to be part of that team. And I think what if you, if you were around at that time and understand what was going on in the city, in the country, in the world with the war in Vietnam. We're in a world that's upside down now. There's no doubt about it. But back then, uh, the country was in turmoil because of the war in Vietnam. The city of New York was going down financially, socially, morally, spiritually, all sorts of problems in the city of New York. And what we did, along with the Jets that year, who won the Super Bowl, and then the Knicks, of course, in May of 70, won the uh, NBA championship. All of us won for the first time, which made it an incredible trio of teams uh, winning championships who had never won before. But for, in our case, um, we kind of, people got on our coattails about, middle of August when we started to play incredibly good baseball and and they just we made people feel better about their lives at the time when they were going through some really difficult times and and people have remembered that and and I, I I and I say this with all due respect to every team that's won a world series there's really only two or three teams in the history of the game where you look back and say you know who won in that 1927 you know the Yankees won the world series with Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig you just no matter what you know that and you know who won in 1969? It's just, it's just, it's, a, it is what it is, and and uh, and I understand that, and and I deal with people every day who who want to know about what happened that year, want to know about the Tom Seaver's almost perfect game, they want to know about the black cat running on the field, they want to know uh, about Cleon Jones getting taken off the field by Gil Hodges, they want to know about the shoe polish incident in the World Series. There's so many things that happened that year. And so for me, it's, it's great to talk about it and, 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 and reminisce with people because it was so special. And no matter how many years I played, the 12 other years, nobody ever really talks about it. It's really about right. 1969. So I understand that, but it's always special for me and uh, to be part of that team, to be able to talk to people like yourself and be on programs like this because people just want to know about that year, even if they weren't even born, uh, because they just heard about it and, and know that it was a very, very special time. Couldn't agree more. I'm not a Mets fan, but I know who won the World Series, as most baseball fans do in 1969. So, uh, so Ron, um, we talk about the Yankees a little bit. And you came up, you were the first DH, uh, which is kind of an, a neat stat. And uh, that bat that you had for that first at bat is in the Hall of Fame. Although I read that you walked in that first at bat, so it wasn't official at bat. So does that mean that bat's in the Hall of Fame, or maybe the next at bat? Isn't the whole I was a DH. I was a designated Hebrew. I screwed up the <laughs> game. I screwed up the game in 73, and I'm very, very proud of it. A Jew got into the Hall of Fame. Uh, there back you go. door. I didn't get in the front door. I got in the back door. <laughs> but you know what? I, you know, let's let's look at the DH. And you know, and you know, 50% of the people love it, 50% of the people hate it. But I love the uh, I love the DH uh, not just because I was the first one. Uh, when I first became the DH, nobody ever thought the DH was going to be in existence for a long period of time. It was a, basically a designated pinch hitter, you know. And look at it now; it's forty eight years later, and the worst thing in the whole world that the DH has not been a universal position. And, you know, I don't, I don't, you being a Marlins fan and, you know, I don't know if you like the DH or you don't like the DH, but I know Derek liked the DH because his last couple of years, he was a DH a few times. Okay. But the DH really started a, a, a brand new, uh, 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 just a, a whole new era in the game of baseball. And, you know, I loved it. You know, everybody always looked at me as a DH, but I didn't come up. You know, I, I, I was a right fielder, and then I became a first baseman when I hurt my shoulder in right field, and they moved me to uh, first base. And people always thought that playing first base was easy. But when you had Greg Nettles throwing you sliders from third base to first, and then you had Stick Michaels and you had Bucky Dent, they're playing shortstop, and you don't know where that ball's going. And then you have Willie Randolph is throwing you – 
uh, sinkers. And then you have a pitcher's pitching staff that you have Catfish Hunter. Uh, and then you had, you know, uh, uh, Mel Stoudemire, and then you had Sparky, and they're throwing the ball at you at first base 90 miles an hour. And people always looked at this as an easy position. It's not an easy position, believe me. I wish I was in the outfield saying hello to my fans out in right field rather than playing first base. But you look at the Yankees now, and they can't put a guy at first base because they already tried like three or four guys. But uh, being the first DH, you know, I'm, I'm very happy that something came out of it. Uh, you know, people don't realize what Marvin Miller did for the game. Marvin Miller uh, uh, should have been in the uh, Hall of Fame. And, uh, you know, like I said before, you know, being the first DH, uh, I had a great run at it. Uh, you know, being, you know, uh, you know, I, I started my book, The Designated Hebrew, out of it. And I had a good run. And it's really, really been fun. And, you know, and uh, I look at Art. And I always told Art he needed to come over to New York with the Yankees and be the DH with me because how many uh, uh, how many Jews do you have being uh, uh, the DH together? And it had been fun for us to be able to play together. But at least he was over at you know across the way from me, and you know he was on the other bridge where they had a lot of money, and I was in the Bronx where we didn't have a lot of money. So it's, it's really been fun. I mean, uh, it's, it's, we had a great time with it. That's changed. And I can tell you, I'm getting messages. People who are saying owners of football teams who say they love the DH. So, you know, we do have a lot of support for the DH. Uh, so, and you played during, you, you mentioned Greg Nettles at third and, and I know you wrote the book about Thurman Munson and Reggie Jackson, you know, those days of the Bronx zoo. Can you talk about some, maybe some Yankee stories from the seventies? Oh, we had a great time. I mean, they were crazy. I mean, you know, people don't realize when you had, you know, characters on the team, when you had Thurman, then you had Catfish and you had Nettles and then you had Reggie and then you had the Thurman and the Reggie fights. And then you had the Goose Gossage and the Cliff Johnson fight. People don't realize we had a fight every single day before a game. Every no, no, no. It was it was it was basically a known fact. The writers knew not to come in when we're fighting. Because back then, there was a no-no for them if they wrote something without being, you know, asked to come into the clubhouse. If they wrote something about, uh, about fighting inside the clubhouse, they were banned from the clubhouse for life. But every single day in the, you know, from the, I say from the 75, 76, 77 uh, teams, there were fights every single day. But that's who we were. We fought. Everybody, you know, that's what we, that's what we actually did. Everybody saw little uh, uh, clips of it with the Reggie's and the Thurman fight and the Mickey Rivers in the Reggie fight. But people don't realize we got our anxiety out and then we played a ball game and we were great. <laughs> so we had, you know, I mean, it was really, really great. It was like, like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. We had two different teams. We had like Sonny Liston and uh, 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 Muhammad Ali in the, uh, the clubhouse. And then we were out on the field. It was like, you know, it was like we had to do business. We had to win. And then when we came back in the next day, it was like, bang, 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 another thing happened. But that's where we were. And uh, it was really, really fun. But, but to this day, we lost a lot of guys. But even to this day, we're so close. The guys on our team were so, so close. And we do so much stuff with the Steinbrenners. And we're up at the Yankee Stadium. And fortunately, for the last 15, 16 months, it has not you know, been available. But we have done tons of Zoom things. And to do some, something with you is the best of the best. Well, that's so kind. And, and, you, and you didn't even mention Billy Martin, the manager, who, who seemed to... Uh be right in the middle of a lot of those fights. Yeah, I, well, I had to get away from Billy a little bit because, yeah, I made Billy mad, you know, because uh, in 77, I came back from a shoulder operation. I had, uh, uh, I, I tore my uh, uh, tendon was completely off my, uh, off the bone. I completely tore it off, okay? And back then they could have, you know, back now they what they could have done is they could have scoped it. And I would have been out probably four to six months. But what they did was Dr. Job and Dr. Curlin out in California 
did my operation and it took over a year to come back. And when I came back to rehab, I came back and everything was unbelievable. And I was having a great spring in 77. And that was a time that Billy Martin, everything was so great. He always a lovey lovey with me and how great was everything was. And then all of a sudden he stuck me out in uh, uh, left field uh, against the Red Sox uh, in Winter Haven. And it was like three days before we were supposed to break camp. I ran into a wall in, uh, in left field, completely severed my uh, uh, kneecap. My kneecap just went completely shattered. Uh, went to, uh, 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 had his surgery up in uh, Lenox Hill Hospital. But the first thing I remember, and as soon as I hit that wall, there's no warning track. It was no warning track. And not the funny part about two years before that, Gary Carter ran into the wall in, uh, uh, in right field where he was playing in the outfield in right field and had about 40 stitches. But when I hit the wall, I went completely down. And we had the trainers, you know, we had Gene Monahan and a guy named Hearn Snyder. They're running out there. And then Billy runs out there. And he looks at me like that. Oh, he said, crap. I just got rid of the last DH. And now I got to put you in the DL again. So, you know, uh, he wasn't really happy with me. So I got on the DL the whole season. And um, that's why I went to Chicago. But he wasn't real happy. But his ex, not his ex-wife, but his wife, Jill, is a very, very close friend of mine. And I see her all the time. And she said, no, Billy really loved you. Oh, like, yeah. I said, he really gave me a lot of love out in the field. He said, I screwed up his uh, season like that. So, I mean, uh, hey, we did what we had to do and uh, it, it was fun. And like I said before, to be able to play up in New York, to, to live a fantasy like we did. And Art and I, he'll tell you, we did something what we really wanted to do. It was unbelievable. It was great to be able to play up in New York where we deserve to play. Amazing. It sounds like Billy had a lot of tough love with a lot of his players. So, um, great stories. Uh, so Art, um, uh, everybody knows about, or most uh, Jewish uh, uh, Jewish people know about Sandy Koufax and Hank Greenberg, actually Hank Greenberg, less known, who didn't play on Yom Kippur, uh, very strongly took the stand to say, Judaism is more important to me than a baseball game. But what people don't know is that, Art, you did the same thing. Um, and it was during the 69 pennant race uh, on Yom Kippur, where you decided to sit out on a uh, sit out a doubleheader. Um, and I know a lot of people on this call, including myself, would like to hear your thoughts on why you, you know, you chose to do that and take that brave stance. Well, you know, sometimes you do things in life and, and, and the explanations aren't as easy as you might think. I, I, for whatever reason, I just thought that particular time was, was for me to do it. And subsequently in years later, I, I, either there wasn't any games on those particular holidays or I just didn't do it. But for some reason, I just I, I wanted to do it and had a long conversation. And, and the, thing, the thing about that particular time is that we were fighting for a pennant and fighting for a pennant for the Mets it was something that was never had happened before. And so I I, I toyed with the idea. And, and then you said we were playing a doubleheader in Pittsburgh. And in the reality of it was I, I just was uncomfortable thinking that what if I what if I stay out and we we lose two games, et cetera, et cetera. But I had a long conversation with Gil Hodges and I didn't talk to Gil very often because Gil was one of these kind of managers that total respect for him, but you just kind of stayed away from him as much as possible. And, and, uh, but I talked to him that day and, and, and he said, look, you do what you, you think is, is best for, for you and I'll, I'll support it. So I ended up taking off. And like I said, we were playing a doubleheader in Pittsburgh and my worst fear is that we lose two games. I'm going to get this eight mail and all this uh, static from teammates, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, we ended up winning both games of the doubleheader. It's one of those crazy games during that season where each starting pitcher drove in the winning run. Uh, both games won to nothing. And it was, uh, uh, for me, it was just uh, unbelievable that we won both games. And I was very happy with that. And we went on, of course, went on to win the, the division, the pennant in the World Series. But again, I didn't, uh, I didn't do it subsequent years for whatever reason. And, um, and but that particular time is, uh, is just was important for me to do it. And, and, um, uh, and uh, I'm glad I did it because I've gotten a lot of positive response from people who've come up to me and said, I remember when, when you took off and I really appreciated it uh, and all this really nice stuff. So for me, it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was good results and thankfully won both games at a doubleheader. Well, let me add my voice and say, I'm, I'm appreciative you took off on Yom Kippur those days and, 
and said how proud and how important Judaism is to you, even during the thick of a pennant race. So, hey, tell Art to, to hey Art need to tell you what happened. What did the players say to you when you came back? It's a good question. Well, when Gil yeah. Hodges, you talked about Gil, the manager as well, who was was supportive. What, were the players supportive as well? It's a good question. Yeah, it, it, it's true. It, 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 you know, again, I'm just I could deal with a split of the games and. Uh, but if we lost two, I was really worried about what the <laughs> repercussions might come from not only my teammates and my fans, our fans in general. But uh, I remember coming back. We were in Forbes Field in uh, the old ballpark in Pittsburgh, and I came back the next day and um, I walked in the locker room and I'm figuring everybody since we won the doubleheader, everybody is uh, is happy to see me. And, and it turned out nobody said a word to me. I walked in and it was very strange and and I went to my locker uh, and, uh, and I looked in the locker and there was this kind of a written sign pasted in there that said, uh, oh, we want a doubleheader without you. Why don't you stay off, stay out the rest of the year? So uh, <laughs> I, I hope that was in good, good uh, taste because uh, I'm not sure who did it. I have a think, uh, 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 I have thought about who did it, but have somebody in mind, but, uh, but I'm not sure, but uh, it was a fun thing. And uh, I'm just glad we won both games. That doubleheader. See, see Ron, Ron knew the answer to that question. He just wanted oh. you to say that out loud. So. So you, you know, yeah, he's heard it before. Right. I know. So, so let's just continue this theme of, of being Jewish athletes and Ron, you know, I, I love some quotes you had about uh, when you were playing in New York, you, you lit more candles at bar mitzvahs than anybody in the city. Uh, and there was a sandwich named after you at the stage deli uh, and art, you know, famously, uh, you know, Shamsky was the dog on everybody loves Raymond uh, named after you. And, and my neighbor for 10 years, I don't know if you know this, Art, uh, was John Stewart. Um, who also named his dog Shamsky, not because you were a great ball player, but because you were his favorite Jewish ball player. Oh. Um, and so that, you know, how, I want to hear from both of you, Ron, how does that make you feel to be, you know, a, a Jewish hero, not just a baseball hero, but a Jewish hero? Well, you know, Art and I, 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 I could talk for him and, you know, we're very, very proud Jews. And I grew up being Jewish but back down south, it wasn't any, we didn't have orthodox, we didn't have, you know, Hasidic, we, we didn't have any of that. Only thing we actually had was reform. And people always, when I came up to New York, they, the, the girls, you know, whoever wanted to meet you and, and whatever, are you kosher? Like that, yeah, I had kosher style pickles before. And, you know, I, I had like uh, uh, Hebrew national and, and, you know, stuff like that. And, but we had no idea what, uh, kosher was to be honest with you and we so you know to be able to to be Jewish and to play up in New York it was the best of the best uh, most people we did not make any money at all okay 73 I hit 329 and they gave me a $500 raise the next year I hit 311 and they took my $500 back and the next year I hit 301 they didn't even talk about a raise to me and back then, 95% of the guys had to have two jobs. My job was very, very lucky. I had like a, uh, uh, just a, it was just unbelievable because, you know, being Jewish, I went to every bar mitzvah, every weddings. I lit every cam candles for every Jewish uh, 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 kid out there. Every weddings, I lit candles. I was a related to everybody. Here's your uncle Ron. Here's your cousin Ron. You know, and they always had me uh, wearing my cap out there. And I didn't want to wear my uniform because I didn't want to be like a uh, like a clown. You know, I'm the only one wearing a uniform and coming in and say, "Here comes a clown." You know, like that. And you know, here's the magic act. But uh, um, they took so great care. I, I know they did that to Art too, and that's why he lived up there. I would have stayed up there too. Uh, uh, but unfortunately, my parents were not healthy, and I, I came back to take care of my mom and dad. And unfortunately, you know, they, they passed, you know, uh, a few years after I was down in Atlanta. But uh, I wanted to come back to uh, New York, but unfortunately, I never did. But I'm up in New York all the time. And uh, we're talking about a sandwich that is named after us at the Stage Deli. The good part about it was they're really, really good friends of us myself and, and Thurman Munson and I, we, you know, we lived down there, to be honest with you. So, you know, when I was down there, they named a sandwich after me. It was corned beef, pastrami, and they had chopped liver on there. And I don't like chopped liver. I didn't like that. And then Art came around 
and his sandwich. Art, should I tell him or, you know, you want to tell him? Go it ahead. Was, you do it. You did it no. better than me. Go Wait ahead. a second. His sandwich. <laughs> hey, guess. All right. Guess what it was. <laughs> I don't know. Yours didn't sound very kosher, so I don't know what no, Art's Just was. take a guess. <laughs> I, I mean, maybe they named the chicken soup after him. I don't no, know. No, ham and cheese. Oh, my God. No, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> yeah. They named it ham and cheese. They, they, the Shamsky, you know, and, and whatever. But, you know, hey, but it was it was unbelievable. The Jews down in the city, when you walk down, and, and, and I lived in Riverdale, okay? And Art lived down in the city. And, and I mean, I was hop, skip, and jump to go down in the city. And when you go down there, the people are just so nice. I mean, it was just so wonderful. And I know, you know, when we used to play in uh, the mayor's trophy game uh, uh, at Shea Stadium or Yankee Stadium, you know, they, they always had a, a big rival. Uh, the, the Jews are pulling for Art and the Jews are pulling for me and the Bronx and he's in Long Island. But it was the fans and Art will tell you, the fans made us. You know, and even to this day, I am so happy and so proud to go up to New York because I, to be honest with you, I call New York my home and I should be up there now doing a lot of Yankee games, doing stuff with Sterling and Michael Kay and uh, with the Steinbrenners. But unfortunately, we cannot. But maybe in July we can and see all the people and all the fans and go out to dinner with all the, uh, you know, the, the people down there and art will uh, and Ori, uh, you'll pick up our check down there and <laughs> My we'll find out a real nice place to go eat down there. We'll go eat. I'm going to, I'm going, I'm going to give a broadcast, a hunting fish club. You've probably been there. I, I have some good friends who, uh, who are owners of that place. Yeah, with Nelson. We'll actually, we'll yeah, actually Nelson, go there. yeah, and uh, we love that. I know Art loves it too. So uh, we're looking forward to, you know, myself to go back up to New York. Well, I look forward to that dinner. It's absolutely my treat. So just to, to change the topic a little bit, I am monitoring the questions that have been coming in. But one thing I did want to address is anti-Semitism. Um, first of all, you know, obviously, you know, when you guys played, were, were you, did you experience any anti-Semitism from players or fans screaming things out like we saw Hank Greenberg dig and a lot of the other earlier ball players, but also because it's been a scourge in, the, in this country and really around the world right now, um, you know, so, so horribly. Um, you know, your thoughts as Jewish role models, do you feel an extra responsibility right now to maybe say something and speak up and, and do, do, you know, do something a little bit extra to say anti-Semitism needs to be stopped immediately and it's just, you know, this is intolerable. Well, Art, do you want to do this first? Art, please, yes. Yeah, we're, we're always trying to do what we can. Um, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to what's going on and very cognizant of what's, what's going on in the world today. Uh, um, I, I was lucky in my baseball career that uh, I, 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 the guys who preceded me, like the Hank Greenbergs and, and, um, and, and of course, Sandy Koufax was when I played, but a little bit before me to start with. But, but um, some of those guys uh, really uh, bear the brunt of some real problems and some vicious uh, things that happened over their careers. I was pretty lucky in a sense that I never really had a major confrontation with anybody. I played one summer in Macon, Georgia, uh, not too far from Ronnie, grew up in Atlanta, and um, and once in a while some cat calls, but I had support from great teammates who who really uh, really never let anything happen uh, around around me all the time, and uh, and so in that regard, I, I really don't have uh, too many things to say negative about my career. Uh, in the minor leagues and in the big leagues really never had any major problems but but i am well aware of what's going on in the world today and uh, i'm always out to do whatever i can to to change that perception of things because i think it's important for for us uh, both of us who uh, uh, are people in our positions to do whatever we can to help the situation amen love that and ron all right you know when i was growing up um uh, i saw a lot of cross birdies and I saw a lot of uh, 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 bad things that happened. Uh, being Jewish, uh, uh, before I got really good in athletics, they always had me sit back of a bus. Uh, I always would uh, uh, drink out of a water fountain that they, they, they did not consider me white, to be honest with you. There was the blacks and the Jews were together basically. And uh, uh, we had water fountains. Uh, you know, we had to drink out of. And then when I became pretty good athletes, 
they wrote on my coattail, you know, most of the, uh, uh, the Klansmen. And, you know, four houses away from me, uh, there was the, the Grand Dragon lived about four houses away from me. And I, I, I saw all these things. And, uh, but, you know, but my parents always, you know, they had a jewelry store on Alabama Street, and that's right, right next to Peachtree Street. And everything down in Atlanta is Peachtree Street. And uh, I saw all the, uh, the pamphlets of being and uh, where they passed out and also all the uh, 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 parades that they had and they had the Klan uh, uniforms on and uh, they had their, uh, you know, picks and uh, ax handles and all that stuff. I saw all that stuff. And so I understood that. And, and you know, when I signed with the Yankees, I, I was uh, uh, played minor league baseball and in North Carolina, and uh, we've had games in Virginia, teams in Virginia. And, you know, back then, there were a lot of anti-Semitic people, but they looked at me when I was in the paper, being the number one draft pick, they always say, uh, big prospect, Ron Bloomberg, first Jewish, first Jew to play in New York City. They would have that in the paper. And you would hear something Maybe if you're on the one deck circle, you might have little cat calls and stuff like that. But in the big leagues, I was very lucky, and I know Art was very lucky to be able to play in New York. And I don't, I don't think anybody, even if they, you know, felt, you know, anti-Semitic towards you, player-wise, they better not say anything to you living in New York City because you, you know, you'd be crucified and, and stuff. So. I was very, very lucky in that. But hey, I would tell you right now, there were people who are jealous of me. Uh, you know, we go down to the garment district and we'll pick up like, uh, I used to take Willie Mays down into the garment district all the time. And, uh, you know, he would always think, uh, we'll get one or two suits and all of a sudden he'll drive up in his pink Cadillac and have like 200 suits in his car. And, you know, I said, guy, it's nice to be Jewish, you know, like that. And I said, hey, yeah, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, it was fun. We, you know, I mean, uh, the Jews took care of us and we didn't have any problems. I didn't see any problems whatsoever. Sometimes, you know, I mean, you talk to Hank, uh, Hank Greenberg and, uh, and Sandy Koufax because Sandy played in New York and then went to the Dodgers and really didn't see anything. But if you played in like Detroit or Milwaukee right. or Kansas City, you know, it, it might be a little bit different back in those days. Right. Well, we I appreciate both you guys um, taking a strong stance publicly right now uh, against anti-Semitism because it's definitely needed at this point in time, as, as we all know. So let's talk a little bit about Israeli Israel baseball. You both managed there. Uh, and I'm, again, I'm monitoring the, the questions that are coming in. These are some of them. Um, now the short-lived league in 2007, but you guys, uh, as I said, the Modine Miracle Art and Ron, the Bear Shamash Sh Blue Sox, and you met in the finals. Um, I beat them. So, I so beat yeah, Art. I know, Ron, you won. Maybe, uh, you know, Art, do you want to you defend yourself here and say maybe why uh, Ron took that game or what happened? Well, let me tell you this. Um, all of us have things in our lifetime that wish didn't happen. Um, wished uh, sort of like a curse and the, one of the curses i have is losing the championship game to ron bloomberg's team um i have to live with that and i'm i'm very happy that in some cases um in most in, in, let me just rephrase that i'm very happy that his team won the championship if i my team couldn't won but i have to live with the fact that i have to listen to him tell me about that all the time and um and it is what it is, but it was a great game. I remember the score three to nothing. And um, the thing I remember about Ronnie is that he actually knew or didn't know very many players on his team. And so I go, I get on him about that. He didn't even know their names, but he was the manager of that championship team. <laughs> Ron, do you want to defend yourself about not? Oh, absolutely. Players? You know, hey, I couldn't pronounce the names to be honest with you. So I call everybody big guy. Even this, to this day and age, I go down to uh, fantasy camp or I go to Yankee Old Timers Day and, you know, all the guys is the big Spanish names with like 400 letters and stuff like that. I can't even pronounce the names. I just call them big guys. And the worst part about it, if you got, you know, when I was in Israel, I had a couple little short guys and then I wind up calling them big guys and they look, look at me like this and said, are you really looking at the right guy like that? But it's a lot easier to call people big guy 
and you won't ever forget someone's name because I know faces. Faces are great. Places are great. But if I have to remember somebody's name, that's going to be really tough. But, you know, to play his team, we played in Kibbutz Gezer. I don't know if you've ever been there, okay? It was going towards Jerusalem. And uh, every single uh, – uh, uh, I, I think, you know, playing in Israel was the greatest thing in the whole world, was to be able to play where the world started and being a Jew and play, being a chosen person – to be able to play baseball over there. And most of the people had no idea what baseball was. And Art will probably tell you, and the funniest thing in the whole world, when we used to get dressed and then we used to go downstairs and we used to get taken to the baseball field and we stayed in a place. What was the name of the hotels where we stayed? It was Dan Panorama. It was Man. a Dan, Dan Panorama, yeah. Dan Panorama, okay, like that. And we came in our uh, jerseys and our uniform, and everybody asked us, what do we do it? And we always told people we're clowns, and we're going to go up to the street in Tel Aviv, and you got to come to see us, like that. And they said, really? Like that? And they said, what do you do? And I said, you know, I get the uh, the balls, and I twirl them and stuff like that. And Art goes in a bicycle and twirls a ba- bike like that. I said, you should see us. We came from the United States. You got to see us like that. And, uh, but we had fun doing it. You know, hey, to be able to play in Israel, to play in the greatest, you know, where we're, our lives started and to be able to, to make people smile was uh, unbelievable. To do something, hey, Art will tell you, we had the greatest time in the whole world. But the worst part about Israel, the food. You know, the food, I could eat the food. I knew you like the food. You know, the, hey, I wanted my steak and potatoes and vegetables. You know, I wanted my okra and my black eyed peas and stuff like that. And they look at me like I was crazy. And then we had to go to a place called Mike's. And that was right next to the counselor place in Tel Aviv. And they had like uh, wings and stuff like that. that. You know, you can eat and taste, you know, halfway decent. But the food, and you know, I know you love the food. But we lost all my whole team. We lost like 25 pounds of guy. They couldn't eat the food and stuff like that. We That's couldn't fine. do it. That's fine. Well, yeah, I know a lot of people would disagree with uh, some Israeli salads they like and the hummus, obviously. Oh, but they, keeping, oh. keeping in the theme of, of Israel, uh, I just want to mention that I, I did just return from an emergency solidarity mission to Israel where I was representing the Jewish federations in North America uh, and cabinet. Uh, and hello to my cabinet friends around this call and, U, and UJA. Um, in response to the uh, the 4,000 plus rockets that were fired from Gaza. And you guys having ex- had that experience in Israel, um, just wanted to hear, you know, thoughts on showing solidarity with the Israelis during what's a really tough time uh, for the country uh, in terms of rockets fired in and the uh, media that's being reported about what's being taking place there. Do you have thoughts on um, how you can maybe support Israel during this tough time? Well, myself, you know, I, I look at Israel and it kills me to see that. I mean, after the story, I became number one. I have so, you know, all the Jews or uh, uh, our people, they're our brothers. We're the chosen people. And I don't even look at, to be honest, I don't even look at the news. I don't look at the papers anymore. I just know, and I, I you know, I know what's happening over there. And when Art and I played over there, we became very, very close with a lot of uh, 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 colonels and generals in the uh, military. I have a camp, it's a New Jersey Y camp, and uh, we bring in a lot of Israelis to, uh, it's the largest Jewish sleepaway camp in the country up in Milford, Pennsylvania. We bring a lot of Israelis uh, and I'm just hopefully uh, they can make it this year and they are mostly counselors, and you talk to them, and they're 17, 18, 19 years old, they're still in the military, but they're very proud. We as Jews are the proudest people in the world. Um, You know, and I look at it, I go to bed every single night, and I pray for my fellow people. And, you know, when you were in your high, and and when you go to, uh, uh, when we talk to a Jewish organization like this, all, all the people that we're talking to, we're relatives, we're family. And what they go through over in Israel, people don't realize what these people have done. And when you go over there and with the group 
And, you know, when, when they come back, you know, I mean, they're in awe. I, I was in awe, you know, being there for three months, I met so many great people in Israel. And, you know, it, even to this day, we still talk to them with their brothers. And, you know, and hey, we try to do everything we possibly can to help them. And, you know, and like I said, I know what they go through. And anytime any uh, 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 foundation, any, any, anything, you know, Art and I probably be the first people to jump on it because we're so proud that we are Jewish and, uh, and uh, we're proud Jews. That's a, basically. I love that, Ron. And, and absolutely, they are brothers and sisters in Israel who should always feel the love and the support and to know that, that us as American Jews always, always have their back. Um, Art, do you have any final thoughts on, on uh, what's taking place in Israel and what, uh, what maybe we can do as American Jews? And you're, you're muted, Art, you're muted. Amen to what Ron mentioned to you earlier that uh, next time you go, I wanna go with you and, and support and do whatever I can to, to uh, uplift the, the community over there and do the things that, uh, that uh, will make them feel better and know that they have support from us over here in the United States. Yeah, amen. Beautiful. And I would just be remiss if I didn't. Peter Kurz is on this is on this call and in the Q and A. Um, I just want to make note of the Israeli Olympic team, the baseball team. I don't know if you guys know this, but they competed at the African Europe 2020 Olympic qualification tournament and won the tournament. And they've qualified. They're one of six national teams that have qualified for the now the 2021 Tokyo Olympics. The Israeli baseball team will be in the Olympics and Eric Colts, who's on, who's the manager of the team, is a friend of mine, and they have great players. Ian Kinsler, Ty Kelly's on the team, and and Ryan Lavarnway, who played, who was the catcher for the Marlins this year. So I just want to make sure I mention that. Um, so just final thoughts. I know it's one thirty here. Um, uh, any what you guys are doing now, Art and uh, Ron? Art, why don't you tell us what you're doing now, quickly? Well, I'm busy uh, doing uh, the Art Champsy podcast. What happened uh, when the pandemic really got underway and really just uh, it really hit everybody hard. I decided that I wanted to just stay connected to people. Or, you know, everything was kind of getting closed down and, and people weren't going out. And I just wanted to do something that would be connected to people, fans, whoever it might be. And so it's been over a year now that I've been doing this podcast. I do it every other week. And, and um, I try to do a combination of sports and entertainment. And of course, I'm on Twitter and, and, and busy with that and, uh, and uh, doing a lot of uh, Zoom calls, Zoom personal appearances. So uh, again, as I've gotten older and gotten to this point in my life, I think the thing I want to do is stay connected to, to people and fans and, and uh, support different causes and, and be out there. Because I think once you just take a step back, people lose sight of you, out of sight, out of mind. So I'm, I'm busy with that. And, uh, and um, I'm thinking about another book. I just always want to keep busy. I just don't want to fade into the sunset. You know, I just want to stay busy. I don't think anybody thinks you're fading into the sunset. We love hearing from you, Art. Great seeing you. Ryan, what about you? Well, basically, uh, both of my kids tried to get me onto social media where I am not technically, in, I, I cannot do any of this stuff, to be honest with you. I still got a flip phone. I still got my rotary phone in the back of me. I still use my calculator. And this is what I use. I, my life is very simple, but I got on it. And both of my kids wanted, both of my kids are doctors, okay? And, and both of them tried to get me on to do this and this and this. I said, there's no way, I'm, a, I'm a scared of it. I'm afraid of it. So what I did was I, I met somebody, his uh, name was Lenny Kaisberg, okay? And uh, a guy named Joe Garrido, uh, he started me with the, uh, uh, to be honest, he started me with the social media. I got very, very big in a short period of time. And we got close to about, oh, about 32,000 uh, uh, followers now. So it's been extremely great. Plus, I have written a new book. It's called The Captain and Me about Thurman Munson. And people always ask me, why did I write a book about Thurman? Because he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, if... Uh, uh, if you have people like a Ted Simmons, or if you have Johnny Bench or have Carlton Fisk, uh, Thurman Munson should be in the Hall of Fame. And I'm doing everything poss possible to get him in. And we've been very, very lucky. It's been out a month already. And the book has been number one on Amazon and it's doing extremely well. 
And, you know, if, if the people want to get the book, it's a great book. You could go on Amazon and get the book. It's a great book. It's a great read. It's not a baseball book where you're going to see stats and you're going to be bored and you say, I'm going to throw this down. It's about a guy from the South, a Jewish guy meeting a blue collar guy from Canton, Ohio, and teaching him how to eat kosher food and eat the, uh, I, we had spring training down in Fort Lauderdale. And I took him down to uh, uh, Miami to show him how to eat matzo ball, pastrami, corned beef, half sours, and Dr. Brown's. And then when we played together, he was my roommate for five years. And when we played together, he took me to a great hamburger place up in the uh, up in Cleveland, the White Castle. <laughs> that's where that's where he took me. He took me to White Castle. I took him to all the great Jewish uh, restaurants, and uh, and then I, uh, then I take him to. Uh, 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 all the, uh, uh, to Joe Stone Crab and all that stuff. He said, this, this food is pretty good, even though the Joe Stone Crab is not kosher, but we went to all the kosher places in the Miami. But uh, uh, it's, it's been fun. The book, I've been doing tons and tons of Zoom and uh, uh, just did uh, Mike, and, uh, Mike and the Mad Dog have done that and looking, I might be getting on to Howard Stern show and and to do it, Art doesn't even know that, but uh, they're trying to get me onto that thing. And they think I'm too uh, shy to get on with Howard. But I don't, that, that'd be good to get on with Howard, wouldn't it, Art? But I mean, uh, I um, Art and I, hey, listen, hey, I, I just want to let y'all know that I've had a wonderful time. Ari and the people have put this thing together and it's taken a little bit uh, longer than what we thought it would, but it's been unbelievable. And the people have put this on. I really appreciate this. It's wonderful to be able to talk to a, a lot of nice uh, uh, new uh, fans and people and, and that are Jews or maybe not Jews, but it's, it's, it's nice to be able to relate to y'all and to be able to tell you our little stories. And, you know, I mean, maybe one day that uh, um, once this is over with, maybe we could go to your temple and, and we could speak and, you know, and talk and, you know, and you, you got to get, uh, hey, first thing I, I got to say, you got to get Art's book. His book is unbelievable. It was number one for many, many of Simon and Schuster. You know, his book was unbelievable. It was great. I mean, it still is great. And my book is great also. You got to get the book. You'll love it. And, and hey, and maybe we'll meet again. But we remember, hey, hey, it's, 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 it's a word that I uh, learned in uh, uh, Israel. And we didn't learn this down south. Mitch Booker, and everybody is a Mitch Booker, and uh, we're part of a family now, and I've learned that, and uh, we love you all, and and we can't wait till we see you again, and hopefully we'll run into each other, and let's pray for Israel, because Israel's going to make it, and they're going to come out a lot stronger, and uh, we just want to be able to help it, and just a little piece, if we do something to make it a lot better, that's all we're here for. Well, amen to that. What a great way to end. Um, and what an honor, honor to be uh, speaking with you both. Uh, both of you guys who have been inducted into the National Jewish Sports Hall of Fame, but more importantly, you are Hall of Fame individuals and just such great representatives of the Jewish people, aside from being obviously incredible athletes. So thank you guys for your time. Uh, thank you for, for all that you do. And thank you for your very strong and powerful world, words on behalf of the Jewish people and on behalf of Israel. So um, with that, I, I will turn it back over to Michael, I believe, to close. Thanks, Ari. Great job. Thanks, Ari. Michael, you're muted. Thanks very much, Ari, for, for moderating this fantastic conversation uh, with uh, our, our, our two baseball, Jewish baseball greats, uh, Art Shamsky and, and Ron Bloomberg. Uh, what a, a fantastic, what an amazing exchange that you guys had. We learned so much about your backgrounds and the fact that uh, you as uh, proud Jews uh, played in, in, the, uh, in, in the, the major leagues of, of, of baseball and, and managed in Israel. It was the, whole, the whole conversation was, was incredible. Uh, can't thank you enough. And we also can't thank our sponsor enough. And, and that's the Free Synagogue of Flushing. And I think both of you know uh, Ed Shorter or Eddie Shorter um, and uh, Ed um, was uh, very instrumental in ensuring that Free Synagogue of Flushing 
uh, be supportive of, of this program. And of course, to Alan Brava too at the Free Synagogue. I also want to thank our team at the JCRC, including Mark Wolf, Noam Gilboard, Rebecca Grossman, Jennifer Glick, Jeff Newelt, Marcy Fishman, and Dori Zofan. And finally, let me once again remind all of our viewers that JCRC will be honoring Ari Ackerman on Wednesday, June 23rd at its virtual gala. If you like to attend or participate, please visit JCRCNY Gala, JCRCNYGALA.org for complete details. And you see the slide up on your screens now. And I'm also going to be honored if you like me, then <laughs> feel free to participate as well. Uh, but Ari is truly deserving of, of this honor. And I am honored to be honored together with Ari. Thank you all very much. Once again, thanks to Art and to Ron, uh, to Ari for pulling all this together. Uh, my thanks to my team and already be well. We should only hear about Shalom, only about peace in Israel. Take care guys. Have a great day. Take care. Shalom, Thank shalom. We love you. We love y'all. Take care. Thank you. So I was just finishing up Art's introduction, I believe.